It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello, and welcome to episode 336 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 30th of June, 2019. I'm Ed Brown, and I'm joined by Lucas Randall. Hey, Ed. And Joe Benamu. Hello. And as always, if you like the show, please go to scienceontop.com slash donate and sign up to be a Patreon. Every dollar helps keep us going. A big thank you to all our Patreons for chipping in. Now, Joe, we've talked on the show a fair bit about the origins of domesticated dogs and how they've evolved to become our bestest friends. But a study published in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences has found that dogs evolved to seek eye contact with humans and even developed muscles to give them those cute puppy dog eyes. What did they find? So you know how when you look at your little doggo, you just want to hug him and squeeze him and call him George? George? <laughs> no. Sure. No. That's a Michael yep. Men reference. <laughs> Or, or it's a Looney Tunes reference, depending on your... Uh, it's general. a Looney Tunes reference. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Not as highbrow as that. Come on. <laughs> well, the Looney Tunes was quoting of Mice and Men. So, it's all, <laughs> it's all circular. Uh, so, you know, we're, we we all know, well, I'm, I hope we all do that, that adorable look when uh, a dog looks at you and you just feel like, you know, they're just looking at you and saying, pick me up and help me, um, or I've done something wrong. <laughs> so, um, a, a researcher by the name of Julianne Kaminsky, who's the director of the Dog, dog Cognition Centre at the University of Portsmouth, along with a number of other researchers, um, they were interested in the anatomical features of um, the the dog's eye and how that correlated with various uh, dog behaviours and and um, how domestication might have impacted impacted those in comparison to wolves. Um, so what they did was they they dissected the heads of um, dogs and wolves, um, oh which, I'm sh- which I'm sure were obtained ethically. I, I, I thought should, you were going to say obtained should, with consent. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I should tell you, if there's one thing I learned from being on ethics committees, although I've never been on an animal ethics committee, is that getting ethics to do experiments on animals is way harder than doing anything with humans. Really? So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Is it because they look at you with those doleful eyes? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I suppose in a way it's kind of like dealing with vulnerable populations in humans mm. where they can't consent for themselves. Yeah, so, exactly. you know, you've you got to be even more careful about what you allow people to do to animals. So, you know, I'm, I'm fairly confident that, um, you know, most most animal ethics committees are, are pretty good at um, protecting um all those lovely creatures from harm. So, uh, nonetheless, they dissected the heads of dogs and wolves. And they found that the facial muscle anatomy, which um, is used for facial communication between dogs and humans, uh, transformed with domestication. There's a muscle called the levator anguli oculi medialis, which is a small muscle um, just sort of above the, above the brow bone. And what it does is it raises the inner eyebrow. And this is actually uniformly present in dogs, but it's not found in wolves. Um, And it resembles an expression that we make when we're sad. So what the researchers suspect is that when dogs do this, it might trigger a nurturing response. Um, You know how it's quite well understood that adult humans respond to um, sort of the the features in infants, the wide eyes Mm -hmm. and large brows and so on. Um, Now, it's called... It's called pedomorphism when those features of infancy are retained in in an adult, and so uh, this feature within dogs um, is is suspected to kind of, uh, in a way, mirror w- what you see in uh, how humans respond to infants or how other animals respond to infants, where those um, those sort of cute features trigger a, a nurturing nurturing response, uh, and they think that it's a result of the sel- of selection, which is based on human preferences. Um, it would have occurred over about thirty. 
3,000 years. And what they found is that there is some evidence of it in the husky, but um, which which is most closely related to, to wolves compared to other other dogs. Um, but uh, but there's no feature of it at all in in wolves aside from some very sort of small muscle fibers, if I recall correctly. Now, the thing about dogs is that they're able to read humans in ways that other animals can't, even our our closest primate uh, relatives, and they respond much better to human cues, such as uh, when humans point or they gaze in a particular direction, and dogs will Mm -hmm. actually respond to that. And it's very important because they establish eye contact with humans when they can't solve a problem on their own. And (laughs) I know that from my own dog when, you know, when I see him kind of, he'll often kind of look towards me when he's sort of a bit helpful helpless like if he if he wants to get up somewhere and he can't or if his uh if his ball rolls under the under the couch or something he'll really sort of look at you with these pleading wide eyes <laughs> um now one of the things they also suspect is that uh there's a an oxytocin component here where there's this uh, uh oxytocin response uh between mothers and babies and the release of oxytocin promotes uh or, you know is hypothesized to promote uh, uh, love, um, and they call this a cross-species oxytocin uh, loop, which again happens between humans and dogs, but not between uh, wolves and dogs. Now, of course, I'm always a little bit wary of any oxytocin claims. Thank you, thank you, yes. Ed Yong. Yes, thank you, and thank you, Ed Yong. But nonetheless, it, it's you know it's an interesting hypothesis that uh, that, that that could be developed further. Uh, and and I, I just think this is really interesting because you know we we we. We relate so closely to dogs. We we live so intimately with them, and uh, it's fascinating to see how how these relationships have pl- potentially played such an important role in how they have developed this capacity to interact with humans and to com- communicate so strongly and understand um, understand human behaviour as well as us understanding their behaviour. Hmm. I have to say, though, it does seem somewhat manipulative, just the fact that I can't scroll down this uh, news article on the BBC without seeing one of the dogs and I was just going, oh, well, I feel try- like I'm being manipulated here. <laughs> try, going, try, try going to the direct uh, article itself on the, um, the National Academy of Sciences website and they've got about five dog videos that you can, uh, you can look at uh, to see their little eyebrows going all over the place. Although the other place that I'm very excited by, which I discovered as a result of this article, is called Dognition. So Julianne Kaminsky uh, is, I think, the director of this uh, this program called Dognition, and you can actually get involved in these um, games that sort of show you how dog cognition works. And there's some really fantastic videos that you can actually sort of learn how to play these games with your dogs and actually assess your dog's cognitive capacities. So I can tell you now, I'm going to be doing that with Charlie Bear. <laughs> uh, I. Um, good luck. <laughs> uh, that's so. What what is it? What you need to go into more detail on that now. What is dog cognition? What is it like? Is it is it like an IQ test or something? Well, it's or? it's understanding. It's it's understanding. Uh, it's understanding dog cognition. So, uh, you know, there's a huge amount of work being done by uh, animal behaviorists and, and scientists to better understand how dogs think, the way they actually, uh, you know, one of one of in fact one of the things that the um, the the, uh, the one of the authors of the paper who I keep mentioning, Julian Kaminsky, she is apparently most famous for showing that a dog by the name of Rico learned words in a similar way uh, as human infants. And, you know, they often talk about uh, dogs as having um, a similar – of being of an equivalent cognitive uh, capacity or age as about a two-year-old child, I think, if I recall correctly, in terms of their capacity to sort of understand language and so on. I may be misremembering that, but that uh, that's that's sort of the mm. – the, the number I remember. Um, so, so you know, these kinds of as as much as these games are sort of quite fun, and a website a website like this gives you an opportunity to sort of participate in this in a sort of a very low level sort of citizen science kind of way. Um, you know, being able to kind of understand uh, how dogs think, the way they respond to us, I think is also really important in terms of the welfare of of these animals because a lot of what we've done with dogs over over time, I think, has been quite 
quite harmful. Um, there were historically a lot of the ways that we we train dogs used a lot of negative reinforcement, so dogs would be punished for things. I, I remember growing up how uh, you know if the dog used if a dog used to wee on the carpet, um, the response would be to sort of push their nose into it, and you know we now know that those things don't actually in any way help a dog to to understand when they've done something wrong. Um, you're often just sort of punishing a dog. It, it, they can't associate the punishment with what has happened. Um, so, you know, I think in a way, just getting people to engage more with how dogs play and how they understand things and the way they think can help us treat them better and ensure that we actually do right by these, you know, wonderful animals. There's certainly no doubt. I mean, I, I, you can see why when when you've got a dog around you and you live with a dog, those looks that they give you, it's it's so – we desperately want to anthropomorphize them and, oh, and, and project these emotions on what the – you know, the dog is feeling guilty, the dog is yes. feeling helpless, yes. the dog is looking at me, telling me he hasn't been fed even though he's a liar. Um, <laughs> all, all of these <laughs> – yeah. you know, and, and, and that – and as, this, as the articles commented about the – you know the eyebrow movements, and you know it's it's amazing just looking at dog how much their eyebrows move, mm. and yeah. and uh, I think the article mentioned that that horses have got some similar. They do, they do, um, but but they, but they don't. They, they don't have expressions in their faces. But they don't. Yeah, they don't have expressions, yeah. and we don't respond to them in the same way as well. Yeah, so uh, we're but, constantly but, looking at them, going, "Why the long face?" Yeah. Because you know they can't, <laughs> they can't do anything else. <laughs> But, the, but um, interestingly, sorry, Joe, but we did also talk, uh, of, I think, last year about how horses can recognize human facial expressions and remember facial expressions and facial features. Uh, so if someone had a really cranky facial expression, they would remember that uh, I was a few on weeks that episode, later. But I actually do remember it being discussed. So, And we've, we've, yeah. we've done other stories about uh, crows recognize not so much expressions but certainly recognizing people and being freaked out by freaky looking people with freaky, <laughs> freaky masks Mask. yeah yes i think yeah. also what's quite interesting in terms of um how the internet has affected all of this affected all of this is that you know since um since social media ha- has kind of given us aside from all the cat videos there's also a huge amount of um websites where we're posting dog videos and, and dog memes and so on dog shaming dog shaming well in fact the dog shaming <laughs> was the one i was thinking about because these um you know again posting images of your dog where you've the dog's been found to have done something wrong um or you know posting videos of people sort of saying to you know the the dogs kind of destroyed something and they'll be asking the dog you know did you do that did you do that and the dog kind of looks ashamed and sort of <laughs> you know it, we we we're we're assuming a lot about these responses and so many of a lot of them we've probably sort of um conditioned into the dogs ourselves yeah, yeah. exactly it's but instinctive they, you know, rather than exactly that. and and but they play into these kind of you know these anthropomorphized narratives um which which are just almost so automatic i mean you know the way i talk to my dog and the way i I kind of just assume human, you know, emotions is just it's just something that I can't, can't I can't not do. <laughs> Whereas cats, on the other hand, they they kind of they play they go the other end of the spectrum. Did you do this? Yes, I did. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> but, but but interestingly, I think part part of that with cats is that they're. I mean, again, this is just speculation on my part, but the the way we we the way we talk about cats as being so distant, so cool. I do wonder whether some of that is because of the fact that they they don't have that expressive face. I mean, they do have expressive faces, but not in the way true. that. No, they do. Yeah. They they have expressive faces, but it's a very different. But they haven't expression. got the eyebrow action. They don't have the eyebrow. Do action. they have the levator anguli oculi medialis yes. muscle? Yes. Exactly. And mostly they, they see you looks. judging. They, um, exactly, exactly. And they can frown. I've noticed they can frown in judgment again. They kind of frown <laughs> at you as if to say, I don't even know how you managed to get through the day alive. That's kind of how I interpret a cat's, you know. I've never noticed time. this. I wonder if this is just you make cats frown, be, Lucas. I don't know. Yeah, could be. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me. I mean, my, my all of my observations are from the perspective of me. Um <laughs> <laughs> 
and and that's a very good way for observations to be as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, can't, I haven't had the benefit of observing uh, through another person's eyes in this case. Um, Not yet. Maybe listeners who have direct experience can uh, can can tweet us and tell us their experience with cats. Do they have cats that look at them in ways that don't seem judgy? Yeah, Wait. the answer is no. All cats are judgy. <laughs> That's just the default position of a cat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think my one of my favorite dog expressions is the head tilt. Oh, yes. Oh, oh man, awesome. absolutely. The dog, the, the head tilt is the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I've noticed... I do that and a lot of humans do that. I don't know if we're imitating dogs or dom- dogs are imitating us or if it's a mutually uh, accomplished thing, but uh, dognition.com is the site that Joe was talking yes. about with the videos and the games. We'll have a link to that, of course, in the show notes. Manipulative creatures, as I said. <laughs> Speak for yourself. I was. All what? creatures, <laughs> by definition, are manipulative, <laughs> surely. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on, Lucas, and let's talk about supermassive black holes. And it's widely believed that at the centre of every large galaxy, there is at least one supermassive black hole. So it's a black hole that's millions or even billions of times more massive than our sun. And astrophysicists thought they had a pretty good understanding of how they're formed. A star at least five times more massive than a sun runs out of fuel, there's a violent supernova, and then it collapses in on itself. And that, plus any other stars, planets, dust nearby that gets sucked in, that becomes a supermassive black hole. But earlier this year, a group of astronomers announced the discovery of 83 supermassive black holes that are so old, so ancient, that that explanation doesn't fit. That would require a slow process, and so that doesn't fit. What other explanations could there be? And, yeah, what's going on here? Yeah, so as, as, as you say, the problem is that they're, they're, the redshifts of these these newly discovered supermassive black holes or newly measured, um, the redshifts indicate a, 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 that they're at that point of what we see now. They're at that point about 800 million years after the Big Bang. And, and our, current, our current theories as to supermassive black hole formation simply don't allow for enough matter to be to be accreted by those black holes to get as big as they did as you said they're up to billions of times the mass of our sun within 800 million years um we, it's just not possible for them to have done that so this has been a kind of a, a you know a thorn in the side if you like of the supermassive black hole theories um, because, you know, it's, it's, it's observations that fly in the face of, of the models. So there's a, another, another team have come up with uh, a new mathematical model. These, uh, these two physicists published uh, their latest model in the astro, uh, Astrophysical Journal Letters, um, and they described a process by which, theoretically, there could be a direct, a direct collapse scenario for the creation of a of a black hole, which means that it wouldn't be a star at all that goes through that process that you described, where a star more than five times the mass of our sun violently collapses uh, and, and turns into a black hole, which then over a long period of time accretes more and more matter as it sucks more and more stuff in, and and they become sort of the anchor points for for galaxies because we we believe that every Every galaxy has got a supermassive black hole. We, we believe that to be the case. Every time we look, we find one. So, so this this new model shows a mechanism by which this could actually happen, where where matter is effectively collapsing directly into a black hole, like it's creating a black hole in its collapse, rather than going through that stellar phase, which which has never you know never been posited before, and. The scenario allows a time span of which this could occur at an accelerated rate until they reach a certain mass limit and then they stop. And there's interactions, funnily enough, between other stars and other black holes and so forth producing radiation, which has a role in causing them to stop, which is fascinating. And I, I want to know more about it. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to get my hands on the, 
on their published uh, uh, study as yet. I've only read other people's, uh, you know, uh, interpretations of it. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the interpretations I've read are actually just an interpretation of their own press release, so they add no further value whatsoever. Um, but I, I'll follow this as, as it develops because, and if I can get a hold of that paper, I can delve into it a little bit more and see what see, see what else about it is uh, is interesting. But at this stage, as I say, what they have developed is a new mathematical model which calculates the mass function of supermassive black holes over a limited time period, and then they undergo this rapid exponential growth. And then that exponential growth can fit within something called what we call the Eddington limit, uh, which, which is the balance of light pressure or radiation pressure and gravity. That's what keeps a star in its spherical, roughly spherical shape it's what keeps it from either exploding or, or contracting down into a, a point. Um, it's that we call it light pressure. It's that balance. So that that Eddington limit um, has a, 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 a the the new mathematical f model fits within the, the the Eddington limit. Although they said it could allow it to to actually uh, go slightly beyond the Eddington limit, and uh, they had a term for that was like the super Eddington limit or something like that. <laughs> it's like there's the, it, it's it. It obeys the Eddington limit, plus a little bit more, which I, I, I found a little bit funny. It's like so they've come up with this new new term, but yeah. So so I don't know yet what it means. I don't know um, more about the model to be able to reflect on it, and and I'd love to read some other uh, some some other um, professionals' um, uh, ruminations and analyses of of their paper. Because at the moment it's a very new story, and it's really just the, uh, mm. you know, people quoting the the, uh, the press release. But it's very very interesting, because this this is completely this is this is new. I haven't seen this before at all. I haven't seen this before at all. So just to to go back to the direct collapse theory. So this mm. is basically the dust and rock and all the protoplanetary stuff that would normally become a star. Instead of forming a star, it somehow just clumps in and then collapses into. So, so there wouldn't, a given the time frame, there would be nothing but dust, because no, okay. there haven't no been rocks, first yeah. generation stars yet in the time frame that we're talking about. Um, so maybe just a little bit. I mean, those very first generation stars had very short lives, um, but they didn't create a hell of a lot more than they like. They didn't. Many of them didn't get up to the carbon stage, right? So they they didn't create a hell of a lot of of uh, stuff. They probably got into the, uh, you know, they would have started by burning hydrogen, and then, you know, they probably got one step beyond that, and that's it. So, so these these things that were collapsing were like gas clouds, um, okay. of of practically nothing, like hydrogen and helium. That's about it. So, yeah, it's uh, wow. it's very interesting. And can you imagine enough of that in in yeah. one spot to to collapse into a black hole? I mean, that's that's pretty. It's a lot of mass. But it does also, I mean, it also potentially explains some of the galactic formations because, as I said, we, we know we, it seems to be the case that every galaxy has got a supermassive black hole in it. Whether, mm. whether it's feeding or not it presents the challenge as to whether we can detect it. So it's hard to detect black holes for obvious reasons. But if they are feeding, if they're actually accreting matter, we can we can detect them indirectly by the effect that they have on things around them, and of course we can see the gravitational effects that they have. In fact, that's how we detected the supermassive black hole the, at the centre of the Milky Way galaxy. We've not seen it feeding, but we can see the uh, using various um, frequencies of light. We can see the impact it has on individual massive stars that are flying around the centre of our galaxy at an extreme velocity. Um, which which can only happen if there's a lot of mass, you know, in, in the middle there. So so our, our our knowledge of them is indirect. But if they're not feeding, then we can all we can do is try and observe the the impact on stars around them. Of course, the further out you get, the harder that is. So there are galaxies that we've not detected there, supermassive black holes, but we believe they're there because um, you know that, that it's a part of what holds the the galaxies together. So anyway. It's uh, it'll be really interesting because some of these galaxies, as I say, are just far too old to have gone through the pr the time that was would be required under the normal black hole formation theory. So it's always been a little bit rocky. But that's what I like about this story is it's it's how science works. 
we have observations and then we formulated models to explain that. And then we got new information, new data, new observations that contradicted that. So we've had to develop models that can work for that as well. Yeah. And until we find more observations that either prove or disprove that, we're still at that point and you know, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. But it's science in motion. It's very cool. Science in motion. Yes. Yeah. I don't, not really motion. Science in process, maybe? I don't know. But it is motion. Science of motion. There's, Science there's, of motion, yeah. Yes. There's angular momentum involved. Um, so it's definitely motion in this case, in, in most senses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I went. I started down that rabbit hole and yep. you took and the ball I just, and I dove right further. the hell in. And, and we didn't see no rabbits anyway. <laughs> no rabbits. No. <laughs> Uh, so let's do a bit of, uh, of fact-checking, shall we? Shall we have a look at a story that's been going around the oh, media in the last couple one. of weeks? Love <laughs> so, <laughs> so the last few weeks, there have been some rather dubious headlines going around, all of them concerning a possible danger of mobile phone use. Uh, the Washington Post, for example, ran with, Horns are growing on young people's skulls. Phone use is to blame, research suggests. Now, obviously, that sounds both cool and frightening. I mean, horns could be useful, but wearing hats might be problematic. Well, I guess it depends on the shape of the horns. They might actually help the whole hat situation. It would also Never depend not. on the shape of the hat, really, wouldn't it? I mean, it's true. You know, it's true. Yeah, yeah, you make we need to point. consider all possibilities here. Yeah. But, of course, they're not actually talking about horns on the top of the head. In fact, it's not really fair to call them horns at all. What they're really talking about is a small spur of bone called the external occipital protuberance. It's a relatively common trait that can be felt as a bump on the back of the skull in the middle just above where the neck muscles attach. And it's more common in men than women, to the point where forensic scientists can use it as part of determining whether a skeleton belonged to a male or a female. So this isn't some... Um, radical news suddenly kids are growing bones in their heads this is a fairly common thing and the idea that this uh research he says with inverted commas uh is talking about is that kids are always looking down at their phones that's causing a strain on the back of their skulls which develops into a bone spur and according to the study upwards of 40 percent of young men may have such extended external occipital protuberances, much higher than, men found, than found in men over 30. Um, this is just not solid a at all. And uh, Joe, we were talking before the show about this, and I didn't realize that one of the main, the lead authors in this study, I think there were two lead authors, but one of them is a chiropractor who sells things to counteract pillows, this uh, pillows thing. to yeah. improve posture and so on yes <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're not huge fans of chiropractors in general on the no. show uh they particularly in australia i think at least have a tendency to be anti-vaccination they tend to have not a lot of science backing them up um and so but i'm not saying that just because he's a chiropractor, no. we should discount this altogether. It is a red uh, flag, though. Absolutely. And, and uh, it's, a, it's a red flag only because, um, you know, and, and look, I have to say, I have looked at a fair amount of chiropractic research in my time, and I have generally found it to be of pretty low quality. Um, it tends to be uh, case reports. There is very little in the way of... Um, you know, high level evidence, um, and so I'm. I am naturally suspicious. <laughs> yeah. yeah, lots of anecdote, lots of, um, um, as you say, case. You know, individual case studies, and leaps of logic. Oh, completely uh, logic. Mm. Yeah. Anyway. Well, Anywho, unfortunately. Study at hand. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, the paper itself is actually really poorly written, as far as I can understand. Um, there's no table of contents, uh, table of results, sorry. So we can't see the frequencies that they observed. There is one figure in the paper uh, that seems to show a difference between people of different ages, but that figure also conflicts with the text yeah. in a major way. It does. Um, so I'm reading this is... Uh, 
John Hawkes, who's a paleoanthropologist, has written a big takedown of it. And he says that according to the text, males are 5.48 times more likely to have the enlarged external occipital protuberance, or just EEOP, let's go with that, uh, than females. And that seems like a plausible number. The EOP itself is much more common in males and females, but the figure shows both sexes having very high and similar frequencies. So there's a, a, a conflict right there. Uh, and he digs into it even further, looking at uh, 2016 study that the authors uh, were only looking at and not any other papers that they were using. It's one of those things that a media has gotten one little soundbite or something of bones in the head and suddenly that becomes horns yeah. and it's a direct result and it's terrible and we should all stop and put our phones down right uh, away exactly you know? I, lo I love the fact that it kind of there, there's so there's so much you can kind of work within this here first of all it is appalling <laughs> science journalism from the media i don't know i wouldn't yeah. call it science journalism and then there's also the moral panic of mobile phones which and young people, are, you know, and young people, yes, mm. yes. Um, so the, yeah, the, the way the media handled it was really quite appalling, and of course, there's the whole everything about mobile phones is going to be the downfall of society. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not, I, I'm not saying that there aren't things to be concerned about in the use of mobile phones. I mean, you know, I, but I horns know, aren't one of them. But horns aren't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> This, this, the Ars Technica piece that um, by uh, Beth Moll um, was fantastic. I, I was so impressed with with how this systematically dismissed and, and dealt with many of the the claims of it. And and right at the end, it's a case of, and okay, let's just say, let's say there, there, you know, there is a higher incidence of these. What were they again? EOPs, whatever they. Yep. Um, now. So what? Because they don't yeah. seem to court. There's no, you know, the spirit self is just quoting. The spirit self is not likely to ever be symptomatic. There's not, it's not causing any problem. The spirit, in fact, is part of the musculature and tendon attachment to the back of the neck, just becoming stronger as, as it needs to anchor itself. So what's the issue? What does it actually do? Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like it's just a, another case of, Let's, as you said, as you said, Joe. Let's jump on two favourite things that we like to to bash in the media, which is technology and young people. And hey, perfect together. And I have to say, you know, again, one of the things that chiropractors uh, tend to tend to do is uh, leap onto a lot of these things. So, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of chiropractors out there are kind of offering um, intervention for, um, gosh, it, it'll be everything from at the beginning of the school year, you can guarantee that chiropractors will be, uh, you know, offering to assess your children because of the way that they might be carrying their school bags. Yeah, um, yeah, and then yeah, it's... Yeah. And then it's, oh, you know, the way everyone's holding their mobile phones is causing text neck. Um, text neck. Which, I love that which, one. Which, they, love, they love creating those, don't they? Yeah. Which, which look, I have to say, as, I, as I say, I have no doubt that, in fact, the way we hold mobile phones and some of those ergonomic things aren't great for us and probably do create some degree of um, discomfort and so on. But the answer to that isn't, you know, just an intervention, intervention without any good evidence that it's of benefit or there is actually a problem. One, one of the things that actually bothered me and, uh, you know, again, I, I, I can't, I just I can't tell from the paper, but one of the things that really bugs me about chiropractic is its use of uh, radiography of of X rays, unnecessary X rays, um, it, it, particularly in young people. And uh, the the paper describes the fact that um, there were two groups. There was Group A and Group B. Group A consisted of 108 asymptomatic university students. Bear in mind, this of course was a retrospective radiographic analysis, okay? So it consisted of 108 asymptomatic university students who had volunteered to p participate in an unrelated research project and, and and they were all radiographed. So they all these 108 university students had x-rays. Why did they have x-rays? What what were they taking x-rays of 108 asymptomatic hmm. Why? Why were they? What why was the were other they study exposing? about? Yeah. What was the other study about that? 108 asymptomatic young people were given X-rays for no reason because you don't go X-raying, you don't go exposing people to radiation for just anything. 
And then, and then the other the other group, Group B, were collected over the same eighteen month period at a single chiropractic clinic, which I assume is the chiropractic clinic of the author, which again is in itself a massive confound. Mm-hmm. The fact that all of these students came from this one clinic, and they were all mildly symptomatic and reported no specific complaints concerning that area. So what again? Why did these people all need x-rays? You know, we don't, we very rarely expose people to radiation for mild symptoms where there is no no real strong evidence of discovering any pathology that requires a radiographic assessment. So, so I, I, aside from the fact that this was all done retrospectively, so this was not a, um, you know, there wasn't any sort of prospective uh, exposure to radiation for research purposes in the second group. Nonetheless, it's. I still have to ask, why were these people exposed to radiation in the first place? And they're making the link to mobile phones, but they have absolutely no data about the use of mobile phones that those kids are going. Oh, absolutely. It's, they have yes. no yes. context or anything. All they're going on is these x-rays. Yes. So they so- can't correlate that with how much screen time they have or the posture that they have when they're using phones. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. purely conjecture. Completely. And, and, and in fact, I think if I recall correctly, the, the speculation that was done in the paper was simply due to their age group, that because of their age group, mm-hmm. therefore yep. they would be more likely to be using mobile phones a lot. Yeah. Well, that's true because old people don't use mobile phones and certainly people over 30 never use mobile phones. I'll tell that to my 90-year-old... <laughs> Uh, great aunt. <laughs> um, yeah. But you don't need to worry about getting any horns from your mobile phone. And that's our show. And as always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 336. Thanks to all our Patreon supporters. If you want to help us out, just go to scienceontop.com slash donate. And thank you, Lucas and Joe. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Now, many people spend hours scrolling through their smartphones every day, but a new study shows it may be changing your bodies. A study of 1,200 people conducted by researchers at the University of the Sunshine Coast found 41% of participants aged between 18 and 30 had developed a bony lump on the back of their skull. This is fascinating. Dr David Shahar joins me now from the Sunshine Coast. Doctor, thanks for your time. Is there any other explanation for why young people are getting these bone spurs? It's, um, it's hard to actually think of others because uh, you got to go back uh, and ask yourself what happened over the last 10 years? Uh, what changed over the last 10 years to bring about this type of phenomenon? And I draw parallels between that and losing bone in space, for example, where huh? astronauts uh, spend so much time in space and they lose bone density. Wow. So it's just at the, the base of your skull at the back there. Are they, are they painful or, or harmful? They could be painful. There is a study that had shown that uh, there were very few individuals who have uh, complained of pain there. Um, I think that it's really not about the bone spur. Those individuals we have tested were not symptomatic. It is about the understanding that bone and joint decay is a dynamic process. It occurs throughout life. And now we understand it starts much earlier in life than we, mm. than at least I thought. And then uh, okay. just as much as we are now, uh, we have educated children to maintain oral hygiene. I think it's important to uh, promote uh, posture, Good posture hygiene. Okay. All right. Good warning Good there, doctor. Thank you for joining us. And Nat, I can feel everyone watching at home sort of improving their posture and being warned on that. Can't help it, can you? Thank you, Cosy.